Hi there everyone, welcome to this week's video. For this week we're going to be talking about uh, Plato's Crito dialogue as well as Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. These are two really landmark uh, texts in the history of philosophy and I think that they're really interesting to read together because really both of these uh, pieces are ultimately reflections about civil disobedience. Uh, we're going to see in the Crito essentially what happens is that one of Socrates' friends comes after the events of the Apology and in a way um, offers to break him out, offers to, you know, let him escape uh, his execution, right? Maybe he bribed the guard or something like that, right? And, um, you know, Crito is trying to make the case to Plato, okay, or excuse me, to Socrates, okay, you've been unjustly, you know, sentenced, that's what you argued in the Apology, right? That's what you argued at your trial. So let's uh, skedaddle, let's get out of here. Let's not let them uh, kill you, basically, right? And the way that Socrates responds is by trying to say, well, no, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to let them kill me right? Uh, and that seems very, like, kind of, I don't know, paradoxical or something. A lot of the times people hear that Socrates did this, like, he had the opportunity to get away. He himself already argued, right, um, that his own sentencing was unjust, right? Um, so why doesn't he just get out of there, right? I think it's a very natural sort of question if you're an admirer of Socrates that you might ask, right? And similarly, other philosophers that were in sort of similar situations have not always taken up the, you know, the, the route that Socrates went. So like, for example, um, the Athenian government wanted to try Aristotle, Plato's student, who we're going to learn about some point down uh, the semester, perhaps, right? Um, Aristotle also um, was somebody who was, uh, you know, accused of impiety by the Athenian people. But Aristotle said, let's get out of here, you know? Apparently, um, you know, the saying that is attributed to him is that he would not allow Athens to sin against philosophy twice, right? It already screwed up with Socrates, he would not allow it to screw up for him. And similarly, you know, you can find all sorts of cases where, um, for one reason or another, people philosophizing about various issues gets them in a lot of political trouble, political turmoil, right? In many cases, it's actually illegal um, to philosophize in a certain kind of way, right? Um, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, if you think about Europe in like the 1600s or any sort of period like that, there was a censor who essentially determined if your publication was going to actually go to print, it'd be legal. And so if you wanted to be a philosopher, then that meant to some degree, at least if you're going to be published through normal channels, uh, that you appease the censor, right? There are similar things going on now, right? People don't like that certain kinds of teachers work on certain kinds of social issues, like uh, issues associated with critical race theory or women, gender, sexuality studies, right? These are considered like hot button political issues now, right? And, um, you know, in Florida, it's increasingly difficult or impossible for universities to continue funding these positions, right? So it effectively becomes against the law um, for you to engage in philosophy, at least of a certain way, about this topic, right? And so it continues to be a sort of perennial problem about the relationship between philosophy and the law that is in a way dramatized already in the Apology, where it seems like the philosopher can never really agree with the political establishment as it is, and that accordingly, that political establishment turns on the philosopher, which is why uh, Socrates is sentenced to death, right? 
Certainly, Martin Luther King was assassinated for his political activities, right? Um, there were also, I believe, if you look at them, of a pretty deep philosophical nature, right? Um, certainly, Martin Luther King was a political activist, right? But he was, I think, also more than that. He studied philosophy at a university. He saw his own, um, you know, political practice as related to a kind of spiritual practice. And even though um, Martin Luther King Jr. advocated for civil disobedience in the case of unjust laws, he actually makes this argument using some of the resources that we've already talked about from Plato, stuff about the harm that you would do to your soul by allowing injustice to continue to fester. So the Crito in Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail really resonate together and provide two different perspectives about the relationship between the law and philosophy and whether and in what circumstances civil disobedience is uh, just or unjust. So with that little introductory um, segment over, let's get into it. Let's go to this um, top left quadrant. Here is really the essence of Socrates' response to Crito, right? Crito saying things like, um, if you allow yourself to be executed, you will be hurting your children, you'll be dishonoring your friends and your family, you will be, you know, um, hurting these people around you and so on, right? And so Crito says, you know, you should flee with me to exile. And the essence of Socrates' response is that the circumstances are irrelevant, that you should never do wrong intentionally under any circumstance, and to evade the Athenian law, the, you know, the authority of Athens, would be to do someone wrong, right? You're hurting someone, in this case it would be Socrates disobeying the Athenian state because they did some sort of wrong to you, right? And this is a very normal way of thinking, right? Children do this. I know that I was especially annoying about this when I was a child, just sort of like, oh, well, they started it, right? I can do harm to them. Harm to them is justified in some sort of way because they did harm to me. But Socrates says the opposite of this view. He says here, and I quote, neither to do wrong nor to return a wrong is ever correct, nor is doing harm in return for harm done. <clears throat> So what Socrates is defending here, right, remember the Apology. In the Apology, Socrates made very interesting claims that, like, a good person could never be harmed by a bad person, right? That seems uh, ironic or strange because it seems like Socrates is himself a good person and that he is, in fact, being hurt by bad people, right, namely the Sophists or whoever. But to understand Socrates' behavior, it's important to internalize that he doesn't see it that way, right? Socrates thinks if you fear death, as Crito fears Socrates' death, right, then you're claiming some kind of wisdom that ultimately you do not have. So Socrates doesn't fear death in the first place. He's not really afraid of these consequences. He doesn't view them as really harming him. Right? They don't harm his soul, maybe they just harm his circumstances. And what Socrates is concerned with is not what do other people think, what uh, you know is going to be the best pragmatic outcome for my family or whatever, but instead Socrates' only concern is what is the right thing to do? What is the good? What really matters in this world? Uh, these sort of practical questions leave him completely you know, are irrelevant to him. He's unfazed by these sort of considerations, right? And so even though Socrates basically in the Apology had to say something along the lines of like, hey, if you tell me not to philosophize, even if you let me off with a light sentence, I will continue to disobey the law. I will continue to philosophize. 
um, which is why you, you know, should celebrate me for doing it, right? I will not accept any sort of admission of wrongdoing in any way whatsoever. Now he seems to be saying, like, that he doesn't really wish to violate the law, right? In that extreme circumstance where they're asking him to no longer philosophize, then he has to follow his conscience. But now his conscience says that he has to essentially bear the consequences for his actions and actually go through with his own execution, which is going to be the next um, Plato dialogue that we really um, examine in a lot of depth. One way to look at it, and this is the um, bottom left little uh, quadrant that we have here, if Socrates left with Crito, he would prove his prosecutors from the Apology correct, that he is a destroyer of the law, right? That he came, he has no intention of following the Athenian law, and moreover, he will um, violate it whenever it suits him, right? He would also, in that circumstance, he believes genuinely be a corrupter of the youth. He would be somebody who, uh, you know, told the youth one thing and acted in another way, right? As it served for his own um, benefit. And finally, it would prove his prosecutors correct that he does not believe in the Athenian gods. He does not have any special connections to Athens, its gods, its culture, right? Which is, you know, indicated by his willingness to just shack up and leave in this circumstance, right? So Socrates, in the conclusion of the dialogue, really insists, like, it's better for me to simply accept the consequences of violating the law rather than to soil my own soul with an action that I believe may be wrong um, and to live, to continue to live. I instead will philosophize and in philosophizing I will prepare for my own death at the hands of the state, right? <laughs> Importantly, a lot of people who read um, Plato, they read, you know, the, these dialogues about Socrates' life, they think that this was a mistake. I'm interested to know whether you all think that Socrates has made some sort of mistake here, or if he should, if he was right, essentially, to continue to follow um, his convictions. But now we're going to see an alternative view that I think can very equally well be said to be, um, you know, a position that comes out of great conscience, uh, a position that calls for maybe the exact opposite recommendation of your action, and one that is very close to us all now is 21st century uh, Americans, and that's Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. It's my belief that everyone should read this document um, in school, in high school, um, and also to revisit it at various points of their college career, if that's something that they end up wanting to do, right? Um, because it's a massively important document. It's not only important, uh, you know, as a historical document for Martin Luther King's activism, but it also prevent, presents something like a philosophical and political vision um, that is one of the high watermark achievements of American intellectual life ever, right? Um, I think if there's a case that Americans have a philosopher like of the stature of someone like Plato, um, then Martin Luther King Jr. is probably like a good um, candidate in my view. And obviously, the context for Martin Luther King's um, letter from a Birmingham jail is that he was just participating in the Children's March. He's now riding from, uh, you know, a jail cell where he's being held. Uh, you know, he's engaging in nonviolent desegregation protests at this time. Uh, desegregation was, in fact, the law of the land, but many southern states um, did not comply with desegregation. And... Martin Luther King Jr. obviously read, led these um, protest movements that were nonviolent and highly, highly um, disciplined as a, you know, kind of way of saying that 
the law itself is unjust, the law has not been fully applied, the law is essentially used uh, as a cudgel against us, but the law offers no protection or safe haven for us, right? When um, these white people in charge of schools during this time continued the segregation policy, right? They used the law against protesters, right? They, they arrested them, they, uh, you know, did everything legally within their power to punish them, uh, but they were not subject to the law. They didn't actually have to follow um, the law themselves. And so Martin Luther King Jr. protested this, and in the letter um, from a Birmingham jail, he really gives an account of why he finds it necessary to go so far as to break the law and to even train other people as to how to break the law and lobby for their own um, conscience in a, you know, uh, 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 organized way. And Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision is going to turn out very, very similar to Socrates' view, ultimately, even though he provides the opposite view, right? He, Martin Luther King Jr. says you should um, violate the law, say laws against, um, uh, you know, um, protests or laws against kind of large social gatherings and so on, um, racist laws, unjust laws, unjust applications of the law. And we're going to see that his reasoning is really broken down into these four quotes, right? The, the letter is very rich, so you could probably bring out a lot of different quotes, but these ones I think are particularly instructive as to his view. You might be actually familiar with many of these because they're, you know, um, rightly celebrated, I think, in American life. So let's move to this first one. I apologize for this glare too. I'll be sure to read everything out loud. Number one, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? And this is maybe something like the thesis statement of his view, which is that um, you should not only, you should never tolerate circumstances of injustice, even if they do not affect you directly. And so in the case where there is an unjust law, you not only have the sort of like, um, very limited moral obligation not to help that unjust law, but you have the much more demanding moral obligation to break that law, to work against that law, right? Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is sort of the view that the, we can broke with no um, unjust laws whatsoever and that you are right um, to violate them. Of course, uh, it's important to qualify that Martin Luther King Jr. is obviously famously a proponent of nonviolent protest tactics. Um, certainly, uh, his view was not simply that like, oh, well, when there's an unjust law or something like that, anything goes or something. To the contrary, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. comes at it from this Christian perspective that is actually highly influenced by Platonism. Part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s arguments for this nonviolent approach to protest is about the purity of the protester's soul, right? If you engage in violent tactics, then you might inevitably hurt someone that, uh, you know, maybe shouldn't be hurt. Uh, you know, you have some collateral damage and so on to uh, your violent counter protest. For Martin Luther King, this is an unacceptable outcome, not just because like someone got hurt, but also more fundamentally that it stains the sort of freedom endeavor that everyone is engaged with, right? <clears throat> and so, you know, it's necessary to engage in a protest as this second, um, point makes clear, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. And as a, you know, an empirical fact that is predictive, this is like about as good as anything any social science can produce, right? 
What do I mean by that? Well, when there's major changes in societies, it is not uh, that involve the reorganization of a kind of class structure or race structure or something like that. It's never from uh, the beneficence of the ruling class, right? It never just so happens like, oh, we think that this old order is immoral. Here's all of our stuff, right? Um, here are these protections, etc., that we were not giving you before. It doesn't work like that, right? People demand freedoms. In demanding those freedoms, they're making a claim to them. That claim then can become recognized precisely because it is demanded. And so, we want to quote number three, Socrates, or excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr. says here, I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all, right? So laws that are unjust, they actually bring about the instability, um, lawlessness, etc., that we attribute to the protesters in virtue of creating the situation in which people need to protest, right? So to say an unjust law is no law at all is to say that we shouldn't follow the law simply by virtue of it being the law, but that we see that the law coheres with, is consistent with, exemplifies a kind of positive vision about human freedom. And this is really exemplified in this fourth and last quote that I want to go over with you. The sort of context before the quote begins is that the greatest, greatest obstacle to peace is, and he says, the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. That's a very strong claim. It's a very strong claim about the role of uh, moderate, middle-class, American, white people in the role of racial dynamics in United States history. And it also is a very stark um, philosophical claim, right? The distinction between a negative peace, which is the absence of profound violence, um, you know, a, a lawless violence and so on, but is consistent with starvation, segregation, etc., right? versus a positive peace, a positive conception of actually existing justice. What the activists, um, you know, for desegregation that Martin Luther King was leading at this time worked for was not merely to stop violence, right? Not only to stop violence, but to establish conditions of justice, AKA to establish conditions of true peace and true um, lawfulness. I hope that you found this discussion interesting. I think that it's always really fascinating to read these texts alongside one another. And I really look forward to hearing what you all think. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Bye.